And so we're just, you know, sort of retreating from the spotlight, uh, much like, you know, cockroaches in your kitchen, when you turn the light on, they scatter and the light's definitely shining upon them right now. So uh, my assumption is that they'll be back. Uh, they're probably going to rebrand. Welcome to Cybersecurity Heroes, an Iron Skills podcast about you, the heroes of cybersecurity. You're about to hear and learn practical and experiential knowledge in our conversations with CISOs, security directors and architects, SOC analysts, and other InfoSec stars so we can become more cyber resilient and safer together. Let's get into the show. Welcome to Cybersecurity Heroes. I'm your host for today's episode, Brendan Rudd, Community Director at Ironscales, an email security platform powered by AI, enhanced by thousands of customer security teams, and built around detecting and removing threats in the inbox. We offer a service that is fast to deploy, easy to operate, and is unparalleled in the ability to stop all types of email threats, including advanced attacks like business email compromise, account takeover, and more. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get into the show. Hey, Paul. Welcome to the show. Hey, Bren. How you doing? Great. Excited to have you here today. I can't wait to dive in. But before we get started, I'd love for you to give us a little bit about your background and what you're working on these days. Okay, sure. Yeah, excited to be here too. So thanks for the invite. Um, So a little bit about me. So I'm Verdium's Chief Information Security Officer. So I'm responsible for our internal security and making sure that, uh, you know, we don't pose downstream risks to our customers, um, but also effectively acting as their de facto CISO. So if they have a major incident, uh, I generally will jump in and help them through it. Um, and as for what I'm doing you know, these days, it's exactly that, quite a lot of ransomware out there. And so helping some customers uh, really get through you know, difficult situations with uh, active ransomware attacks. So never a dull moment. And anything uh, particular keeping you up at night these days? Man, what isn't? Um, I do try to sleep at night, but uh, sometimes it's a little hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, ransomware keeps me up at night. Uh, I'm still sort of uh, reeling from the Kaseya attacks uh, that our evil, uh, you know, per- uh, performed a couple of weeks ago, or a week and a half ago. Time flies. Um, yeah, that concerns me, right? So, you know, MSSPs and MSPs, you know, we're an MSSP, so we have a big responsibility to ensure that uh, we don't pose risks to our customers. And when you've got a supply chain attack like Kaseya, you know, that's it's absolutely crippling, not just to the, the company that uh, kind of facilitated the attack, but also its downstream customers. And uh, and uh, if anything uh, keeps them up at night, it's a situation like that where, you know, through maybe one of our vendors, one of our technologies, um, you know, we are, you know, uh, an avenue for a ransomware actor to get into a, a customer environment uh, that worries me. So, you know, we've taken uh, gone to great lengths to ensure that that's not possible. Uh, simply through the ways that we connect to our customers through zero trust models um, and also just the preventive controls that you know we put in our own environment uh, backstop by detection controls um, you know through our cyber fusion centers which is where i'm at today uh, that's what's in my background there so here we have analysts uh, intelligence analysts uh, you know pouring over volumes of data looking for risks both in our environment and our customer environments so that we can get in front of ransomware attacks uh, you know when we identify precursors and uh, that's the key thing. Try to get, you know, stop it from becoming a ransomware attack. Because once we get the phone call that says, you know, I found a ransom note on my desktop, what do I do? It is very often, uh, you know, a very significant problem for that uh, company to get through. So, yeah, that's it. So in light of the recent news around Revil going offline, or at least their blog, what do you think this means and how do you think this is going to play out? Yeah, so you know, the Happy Blog, which I always loved that name, um, has gone offline. And, um, you know, we've seen situations like that happen before. I think most recently NetWalker, another ransomware as a service operator uh, that was very prolific last year. I battled them throughout 2020. Um, they went offline in, I think it was February, might have been January. Um, but, you know, through that, uh, one of the things that was known is that a, um, a partnership between the FBI and Europol uh, we're actually able to take them down through individual attribution, which is actually a very difficult thing to do, uh, identifying the actual people uh, behind the attacks. Um, and we knew that was law enforcement. Uh, this time around, uh, we don't. Um, and I think that um, you know, were it a law enforcement action that uh, took them offline, uh, we would certainly know about it. Um, so my perception of what's going on right now is that after the Kaseya attacks and other 
very high profile attacks that they pulled off, like JBS, for instance, um, they either have a lot of heat on them um, or just don't want all the attention. And so are just, you know, sort of retreating from the spotlight, uh, much like, you know, cockroaches in your kitchen. When you turn the light on, they scatter and the light's definitely shining upon them right now. So uh, my assumption is that they'll be back. Uh, they're probably going to rebrand. And I've, again, I've seen that happen many times where you've got a ransomware variant. And, you know, if you take a look at the code, you can see, you know, traces of its predecessors, um, you know, through, again, you know, either the sale of the code um, or just simply the rebranding of the code into the next variant. So I'll, I expect that's going to happen. Who knows when? Uh, probably not too long, uh, simply because, again, ransomware is so profitable um, that these guys are you know, actively interested in victimizing, uh, you know, uh, their targets. So we keep hearing about it in the news. It's it's not going away. I would love for you to help us understand what was done or not done by the companies that allowed someone to break through their quote unquote wall. Yeah. Well, you know, unfortunately, there's quite a lot of things that can contribute to uh, you know a serious incident like that. But for me, there's really five areas to be focused on, and that's preparedness, prevention, detection, response, and recovery. And you know, those are just words, but within each of those, there are disciplines that uh, you know organizations have to implement within their walls. Um, so preparedness, that's all about incident response plans, uh, having the right relationships with expert providers that can jump in in the event that there is an incident. You know, having cyber insurance, uh, having uh, outside counsel that can help you in a sort of a breach coach uh, function, um, and then testing the incident response plan, which is an absolutely critical thing. I've seen too many organizations write an incident response plan and then just shelf it um, or just consider it to be a document. And in my opinion, an incident response plan is not a document. Uh, it is something that has to be tested. Uh, you have to build muscle memory uh, because if you know you wake up one day and all of a sudden there's a ransom note on your desktop, you have to know what to do in the moment. Um, and I've seen people make big mistakes just in the in the moments after the, uh, the, the notice of a ransom attack that's really crippled forensic uh, um, artifact gathering. So, you know, for example, um, working a case right now where uh, an organization was ransomed um, by a group that I'd actually not run into before called MAKOP, M-A-K-O-P. And um, this organization uh, had no incident response plan, also lacked a lot of the other controls that would have stopped this from happening in the first place, which I'll get to. Um, but because they lacked the incident response plan, one of the things they first did was shut down the systems that were encrypted. And that's a really bad thing to do in the moments after an incident, because what happens when you reboot a system is you, you basically uh, destroy whatever evidence might have existed in memory. Uh, memory is volatile. And when you shut a system down, memory goes away. And memory is a vital uh, artifact for a forensic analysis. And so we don't have the ability to look at memory and see what's actually happening on the operating systems at the time. So we will have a harder time seeing um, you know, evidence of who was logged in or from where were they logged in and things like that. And actual processes running in the process tree, all that stuff is, is just lifeblood for a forensic investigation and we don't have it. So you got to default to event logs and that's one of the other controls um, from a detective side is ensuring that you've got all of the interesting and relevant security logs in a central repository that you can monitor continuously. Uh, typically a SIM is going to do that. Uh, that's a SIEM. Um, and and, uh, you know, this, this organization didn't have that either. And so uh, we're relying upon the event logs that are living on the systems themselves. And in the case of the, 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 um, the issue that I'm talking about, uh, this organization was completely compromised with domain administrator credentials compromised and the entire domain compromised. So when that happens, the threat actor who's got the keys to the kingdom can go and delete whatever logs they'd like to. Um, and it makes it, again, extremely difficult to be able to do a forensic analysis of it. So we're in the process of imaging hard drives and you know, pouring through uh, data in that manner. And it just makes it a longer process to get through an investigation. And that's just challenging. Um, but again, you want to be able to prevent this stuff from happening. And that's where the preventive controls come in. And there are a handful of things that you've got to do there. Um, you know, well, there, I, there's more than a handful. But uh, one of the key ones is really good endpoint protection. Uh, so a modern EDR tool, endpoint detection and response. I'm not going to name any brands. There's a lot of really good ones out there, but it's critical to have that uh, because of for a couple of reasons. Most of the really good modern ransomware um, will run effectively fileless and execute directly in memory. And an antivirus platform that's just looking for file hashes in a file system is just not going to see that and not see it happening. Um, so, you know, you're not going to be able to pick it up uh, as it's happening along the kill chain. And that's what an EDR can help you do. Um, other things that you got to do to prevent uh, ransomware, well, one specific one is understand what your attack surface is. So what do you have exposed to the internet? Uh, that's critical. Um, we've seen a ton of ransomware attacks uh, that were, um, the initial access was gained through exposed RDP, so Microsoft Remote Desktop Protocol, that's open to the internet. 
Um, and those are, you know, everywhere. And there are scanners out there that the bad guys have. They're looking for that stuff. And then they'll, you know, try to either brute force it or look for compromised credentials that have already been, you know, stolen and sold around on the dark web and uh, gain entry that way. Um, or just simply exploit a vulnerable RDP. Uh, similarly with VPN, we see a lot of vulnerable VPN infrastructure that gets attacked a lot. So patch your VPNs would be the thing there and, and make sure you get RDP just off of the internet uh, at large. Um, and then there's you know a handful of other things like security awareness training will help prevent uh, things like phishing attacks. That's important to remember as well. Um, but all that said, you know no, no prevention control is going to be perfect, so you have to have detection. Um, and that's again where the sim and the monitoring and threat intelligence come into play, uh, because with you know good threat intelligence, you can see into you know attacker communication streams through signals intelligence or SIGINT, um, and you can even do human intelligence gathering on the dark web forums or HUMINT uh, by engaging you know in a uh, I guess a sort of a nefarious way with a threat actor um, and, you know, uh, and surreptitiously getting information from them just by interacting with them. Uh, that's a tricky thing to do, and it's not something that we would ever recommend an average Joe off the street uh, to go on a dark web forum and try to interact with the threat actor, but, you know, you can do it if you know what you're doing. Um, yeah, all that stuff constitutes an ability to detect uh, something happening uh, that's weird in the environment, and then, you know, you got to act in the response motion. So that's where, again, testing the incident response plan comes in. Um, we talked about that earlier, but then you got to execute it. And uh, that's all about communications, uh, really getting the right people involved and knowing their roles and responsibilities and you know, taking the right steps immediately and acting quickly, but not hastily. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of things you can make missteps in an uh, immediate response. But, you know, back to that example of the current ransom case that we're working, this is a completely compromised environment. So every account is no longer trusted. Every device is encrypted. Uh, nothing can be trusted in this environment. So we have to completely rebuild it. And so that's what recovery is all about. So what we're doing for these guys is we're re-architecting their Active Directory domain in Azure AD. Uh, using Azure ADDS, which is a, a pretty modern way of securing an Active Directory infrastructure. And then we're setting up a secure enclave within their network so that we can start reconstituting systems and applications onto that secure enclave. And when we've got that done, we're just going to blow out the other one. Uh, the compromised one will cease to exist. And that's really the only way you can get through a situation like that because the entire environment is, uh, is again, no longer trusted. So, yeah, I, you know, it's a long way to answer your question. There's a lot that you can and should do, um, but those are some quick things that uh, you should at least be thinking about as you're uh, dealing with the scourge of, of ransomware. Yeah, and I, I was speaking with a guest the other day that was saying if you cannot trust that those laptops or devices are 100% clean, you actually have to trash them. So... I mean, do you have a way of confidently conveying that message to your customers or even for yourselves that this device is 100% safe to put back onto the network? Or do you ever trash devices if you're not sure? So that's that's always a risk-based decision for the business to make. So the customer, certainly we can guide them to do that. And I think probably what your other guest was getting at is, uh, you know, malware that might be at the BIOS level of the actual physical system. Uh, root kits can operate like that. Um, and so at that point, you really can't trust the device unless you completely flash the BIOS, which might be a step that I would take rather than throw the device out. Um, but if a customer has a very high risk aversion, so they can't accept any risk, then yeah, they might want to just replace the devices, um, which is obviously extremely costly. Uh, so again, that's why I said it's a business or a business decision. It's got to be based upon risk. Um, what we do uh, and, and what we'll, we'll do for these guys is basically um, we need to inspect their gold image. Uh, we, as of yet, don't know how long the threat actor was in the environment due to that log situation that I described. Um, so we, we don't know whether or not even the gold image is compromised. Uh, we do know how the threat actor propagated the malware. Um, like I said, they had uh, full domain access. And so they created a GPO, a group policy object, which whenever somebody logged in to the network, the GPO downloaded the malware uh, and uh, ran a scheduled task to execute it uh, across the environment. So within the two hours that this all happened, you know, basically, you know, pretty much every device had logged in, but it was it happened at like five in the morning on Sunday, um, and so they had the benefit of their remote workers and uh, you know non. Uh, you know, uh, weekday type workers uh, that were not connected to the network at the time. But there were some people that had their VPN connection still turned on. So they were connected to the network. And then when the GPO was pushed out, they downloaded and even some remote machines in home offices are encrypted. Um, so, you know, that's that's tricky to get around uh, and tricky to solve for. But in that case, uh, like I said, we don't know how long the bad guys have been in there. Um, so we're going to take a look at their gold image. Uh, we'll probably just build them a brand new gold image and then uh, get that pushed out. So re-imaging a lot of devices, again, building uh, servers from scratch. Um, fortunately for these guys, they actually did have some data backed up that didn't get encrypted. 
um, which is actually, in my opinion, pretty surprising in this case uh, because they were so widely compromised. Uh, typically, we would see the threat actor uh, encrypt the backups as well, um, simply to uh, gain additional leverage so that when you, you know, if they're actually, if you're considering paying it, you have, you know, a, a lot of pressure because you can't recover the environment from backups. Um, but even with the, the the data there, so the way these guys were backing up was Veeam image captures, so basically a full image of the machine rather than just the data, and we don't trust the images at all. So we're going to have to take a fairly lengthy recovery uh, process here where, again, in a secure enclave that's disconnected from everything else, we'll restore the backup, uh, the image, and then we'll selectively restore data after ensuring it's clean over to the new, newly built applications. Complicated process, takes a long time. Uh, and of course, the business is under a lot of pressure uh, throughout this whole situation. So not fun for anybody, which is why preparedness is so ultimately important. And uh, we all have to be worried about it because this is an indiscriminate threat that uh, goes after everybody. Yeah, as they say, prevention is better than cure and less costly. The last time we spoke, we were discussing the Casilla ransomware attack and the growing supply chain vulnerability posed to customers. You then went on to share some of the research you guys are doing at Vertium on ransomware as a service, and you shared some really scary insights into the business operations of the criminal groups and how they've evolved over the last couple of years. Would you mind explaining the business operations, the differences between the different groups like Revol and DarkSide, for example? Yeah, uh, definitely. And yeah, we have studied it a lot. Um, so yeah, ransomware has evolved over the past couple of years um, due to its profitability. And so there is an ecosystem built up around this economy where uh, ransomware as a service operators, and I'll, I will describe what that means, but ransomware as a service operators have built relationships with other uh, threat actors that do different things for them um, in sort of an organized crime fashion. And truly, in my opinion, it is organized crime. And so when you look at these named groups, like the ones that you mentioned, you know, the people at the top, more often than not, are not like the hacker uh, wearing a sweatshirt in a basement someplace typing away all night. Um, they're crime lords. And those crime lords fund the development of the malware and they fund this whole entire ecosystem. Um, and within that, so that the, the main groups, the named groups, they'll offer the malware out for lease. And typically when um, an affiliate, which is the, the organization that leases from the main group, um, gets the malware, they're going to get a custom package specifically for them that might include other tools like a scanner or some mechanism to propagate the malware. Um, and so they have that for some period of time. The lease is not a permanent thing. You don't buy it. You lease it or rent it. Um, so what that implies is that the moment of lease, there's a clock ticking for the bad guy. Um, they need to be able to deploy that ransomware as quickly as possible. So by the time they've leased it, they've already broken into some some victim organization. And so what that means is they're spending a lot of time targeting and profiling who their victims are. And there are specialists that do nothing but that. So if you picture this big sort of ecosystem with all these different threat actors, there are specialty groups that do different things. Um, the affiliates make use of a variety of them, including targeting and acquisition specialists, initial access brokers, who are the people that are just scanning the internet at large, looking for things like RDP on the internet, like I mentioned, um, or vulnerable VPN infrastructure, breaking into it and then selling it on. And they might sell it for a, pro a percentage of profit from the ransom, or they may sell it for some sum of money for you know $20,000 or something like that. Um, then again, within those specialty groups, there are um, privilege escalation uh, specialists that once they break in, they reconnaissance uh, the environment and then they, they'll escalate privileges, usually through an attack that involves Mimikatz running on a domain controller or something like that. Or if they get a foothold anywhere, run Mimikatz, scrape memory, find some credential, and then go from there. Um, and then there's also exfiltration specialists. So one of the other things that ransomware as a service groups have really adopted is what's called the double extortion model. Um, so all that means is they're extorting you in two different ways. One is they've encrypted your environment, so there's a, ma a massive disruption to your operation, um, but they want more leverage for a couple specific reasons. So I think everybody at this point should know that you have to have good backups because they will help you recover from ransomware, but the bad guys know that we know that, right? So they want something else that they can pressure you with, and that's data theft. So especially for regulated organizations that have interesting data like PII or PHI or even just trade secrets, they're going to steal that data and then they're going to threaten to leak it on the dark web or sell it to another threat actor uh, to get you to pay the ransom. Um, so th that means of double extortion places just an immense amount of, of pressure on the victim. Um, and often, if uh, an organization has been massively encrypted, like what I described with that full domain compromise, um, and they don't, they lack backups or an ability to recover quickly, and they've had data stolen from them that is sensitive and could result in litigation or other significant liabilities, they are likely to have to pay the ransom. 
they may not have another choice. Um, and so we never say, you know, Mr. Customer, you should pay the ransom. Uh, it's always a business decision. So our job is to give them the facts. And the facts are your likelihood of recovery is X, you know, maybe low, medium, high. Um, and the likelihood of that data theft being a significant exposure point for you is low, medium, high. And, you know, with that and with their legal counsel and with insurance, uh, the business can make a decision as to what to do and what the value of that actual data and the situation actually is. Because the, the ransom demands are going to start, you know, way up here. Um, but often uh, through negotiation, you can bring it way down. Um, and the way that you know we look at that is the value of that data. So let's say somebody steals a bunch of personal health information records. They can sell those in the dark web, but they're only going to get maybe 200 bucks a record for a really, really good quality. Um, so the value of like the, the ransom is much more valuable than the data itself. Um, but you always start from a place of, of you know, uh, uh, data-driven approach where we can, will tell the threat actor, here's how much you're going to be able to sell this data for. So we're not going to pay you more than that. And especially if we can recover the environment, we don't need the decryptor. So you know, just leave that out of the equation. We don't need it. We don't want it. Just keep it. I'm not buying that from you. Um, and then just you know, sell me back my data. And that's really how they look at it. When you're talking to these guys you know, in their chats, or, you know, whatever, however they want you to interact with them, they're in a business transaction. You're buying a decryption key and you're buying your data back. They don't consider it a ransom. They consider it a purchase. So they're selling you back your data or they're selling you the decryption key so that you can go on with your, your life. Um, yeah, and it's it's tricky. Um, but, you know, again, it's a scary world out there and it's a not fun situation to be in to have to negotiate a ransom. And I know we're going to dive into that in more detail in a couple minutes, but I just wanted to go back to some points that you mentioned, which I want to go deeper on. So what is the solution for extortion? How do you prevent the extortion of sensitive data? No backup plan is going to solve for that, right? Yeah, well, that's true. Um, so there are a couple of ways that you can do it. Um, I suppose if you've been just utterly compromised, like what I've described, and domains completely locked up, and you've got domain administrator credentials that are in the bad guy's hands, um, even you know encrypting your files is not necessarily going to help you because they may have the password to decrypt them because they've been in your network for so long. But that's a decent strategy. So ensure that that sensitive data is encrypted. So even if it gets stolen, um, it's not of value. And I've seen that happen where um, a retail organization got ransomed and a bunch of data got stolen. And what they stole was transaction records from their e-commerce site. Um, <clears throat> but because the, uh, the, the actual credit card information um, was either, I can't recall if it was not in the records or if it was in a hashed value, um, it was of less value to either you know, the, the bad guy or for sale on the internet or on the dark web. So what they had in that case was just you know, the PII was the human name, the address, the phone number, and like their email address. Um, which is something, it's still PII, but it's not as valuable as having, you know, a credit card number or a social security number. So, you know, minimize what sensitive data you have, number one. Reducing your footprint is always, you know, the, the, the best strategy. If you can reduce the types of sensitive data you have, great, but you can't eliminate it, right? So then what you got to be thinking about is, again, preventing these bad guys from getting in in the first place. Um, so if you can stop them from even, you know, entering the environment, that's going to be your best strategy. Um, but one thing to note is that along that kill chain of double extortion, there are multiple opportunities opportunities to detect and stop these guys before they get to the point where they've stolen data and then executed the encryption. Because uh, with double extortion, what you have is, you know, the, the bad guy breaks in or has bought access from some initial access broker, and there's an a, opportunity for detection, right? So you should be able to observe somebody break into your environment one way or another, exploiting an RDP server, you know, logging in from a weird Russian IP address or something like that. Um, you should be able to detect that. Even if you can't, let's say they get onto a machine with some low-level credentials, and then they run a tool like Mimikatz, like I described, or some privilege escalation attack. There's another opportunity to detect that, right? So that's a progression down the kill chain, and you should be able to see that happening if you're doing the right things around monitoring and detection and all those controls that I described earlier. Um, but even if you miss that, let's say they get the domain admin credentials, right? Let's say that they've got to that point, and now they create a new GPO, right? So like I described, they're uh, using that to push malware out. So there's an opportunity for detection, too. If you see a GPO get created and, you know, you know you didn't do that as the domain administrator that's responsible for the environment, you should be doing something about that. That should certainly trigger an alarm system place. There, again, is an opportunity for detection. Um, and then let's say they're doing the reconnaissance and staging. So staging means they're taking all that sensitive data from wherever it exists in the environment and bringing it to some sensitive 
different from place so that they only have to steal it once and just one data stream going out and that makes it easier for them. Um, you should be able to see interesting connections that are not often happening in the environment, like new network shares getting added or big data transfers from other areas of the environment to a single central system. Be watching for that kind of stuff. Watch for anomalous network behavior because that is an evidence that data is being moved. And if it's sensitive data, first off, it shouldn't even be possible to move sensitive data from a, a, a high trust zone to a low trust zone. Um, and then the uh, the data exfiltration itself, there's a couple strategies that bad guys use for that. Um, they often don't use FTP or SFTP anymore. Sometimes they do, but not, not super often. Uh, but what they usually do, at least in my experience, is uh, they'll use something like a mega upload or a P cloud or one of those other uh, public cloud storage applications. And the way those work, um, and first up, I'm not suggesting that P cloud or mega upload or anything like that are directly involved in this. They just offer a service. They don't necessarily care you know, what data gets stored on their platform. Um, but I, I will say that even with mega, we've been able to, in situations like that, get them to take down uh, the data th uh, that's been stolen, if we can prove it. Um, but those applications, they all, or at least a lot of them, again, uh, work off of a synchronization uh, application. So there's a, an app that gets installed. So again, there's a detection point. If you notice an application getting installed, like a mega sync or a P cloud sync, uh, that's, you know, it shouldn't happen, especially on a sensitive server. Um, and then you'll, once it's uh, installed, that application will point to the directory where all that data has been staged, and then it immediately goes out to the cloud. And so again, if you're looking for large data transfers out, you should be able to see that. You might even be able to stop it. Um, so all those are opportunities to detect and stop this before it gets to the point of ransom, because all of that stuff might encompass the space of a month uh, before they actually execute their actual objective, which is crypto locking the environment. Because uh, once you've gotten to the point where the environment's crypto locked, you know, all game's over. Uh, you got to call somebody like me. Cybersecurity Heroes is brought to you by Iron Scales, an AI-powered self-learning email security platform that helps security professionals proactively prevent, detect, and remediate phishing attacks in a matter of seconds, not hours or days. And we have an exclusive offer for our podcast listeners. Discover dormant phishing threats in your organization's mailboxes. Get a free 90-day scan back with a detailed report. Integrate in seconds with two clicks via API to Microsoft Office 365 and see what your current email security is missing. Go to ironscales.com slash free scan to learn more. Coming back to negotiations, I hear you're one of the best frontline negotiators. What is it like negotiating with these threat actors? And can you tell us what really goes on behind the scene? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things to think about. Um, first off, I cannot claim to be one of the best. Um, I just have done it a lot. Um, so the when you get a ransom note, um, in the ransom note, it's going to be you know a very scary threat. You know, we've stolen a terabyte of your data, and uh, if you touch your files or you do anything to these systems, they're going to be destroyed. Um, so you better get in touch with us. And there's a couple of ways that they ask you to get in touch with them. Sometimes it's an email address uh, that they want you to email, um, like a Proton Mail or a QQ, some anonymous email address. Um, other times and more often, again, in my experience, there's going to be an onion URL uh, that they'll ask you to click. Um, and in, again, my experience, that's typically not going to be a site that's going to download secondary payloads to your machine just by a drive-by download attack. But still, I wouldn't do that outside of an isolated, protected environment that you can just you know, uh, blow away the, the VM that you're operating on. But if you click that link, very often what happens is you'll go to the Onion site and there will be a chat app, like a Jabber or something like that, which, you know, is very similar if you've ever been on a website that has an e-commerce chat uh, that pops up and says, what can I help you with? Um, very, very similar. So that will pop up um, and it usually be blank, um, but it might say, you know, admin is waiting for your, your response or something like that. So type in, you know, hello uh, or something like that. And at that point, a customer service representative who's part of that uh, uh, RAS ecosystem that I talked about. There are customer service people within there. There's other groups that do other things as well, like uh, cash outs and stuff like that. But the customer service rep is going to hop on and you know they'll know because of the, the URL that you followed, who you are. They'll know which company that they're talking to. Although I've been in situations where they even screwed that up. I can tell that story. It's a funny one. Um, but uh, they'll know who they're talking to. And so at that point, they'll they'll uh, tell you what the demand is. Um, you usually have to ask for it. Um, so you ask sort of what's the strategy and what's that's like. Uh, like I said earlier, it's very much they consider it to be a business transaction. So if you treat it um, you know, aggressively or you talk down to them or call them criminals or terrorists or whatever, it's going to go very poorly for you. You can't really do that um, because I've seen 
seen this happen where um, a customer, uh, you know, that came to us afterwards um, engaged with the threat actor having no training in this and really never had, having done it before and made some mistakes. And what happened was rather than negotiate the ransom down, the ransom ended up going up and up and up and up because they were, you know, the, the bad guy was just getting annoyed and you don't want to annoy him. So um, it's very much a psychological game. Um, you know, it's a little bit of, uh, you know, I, I talk about knowing your enemy a lot, but put yourself in their, their shoes and their mindset. Um, like I said, these are customer service guys, the people that you're going to interact with in that chat are not the hackers. They're not the guys who are moving around your environment and stealing data. They're, you know, probably in a call center someplace or something like that, uh, truly. And, um, you know, they're just there uh, working for their boss uh, to extract money. And um, so what I always do, especially in a data theft situation, it's, it's really mandatory for them to be able to prove to me uh, that they've actually got data. So I'll ask for what's called a proof of life. And a proof of life is either going to be screenshots of directories that they've accessed, um, or often what will happen is they'll show um, uh, like a screenshot that includes PII. So usually in uh, situations I've been in, it'll be like a screenshot or a, a photocopy of somebody's driver's license or social security number, um, or it might be a screenshot of a database that's got a bunch of PII in it. Uh, and if they can prove that, then that definitely changes the dynamics of the conversation a little bit. Um, but generally, you know, what I do is, you know, I'm, I'm effectively uh, there to represent the business. And so, you know, I, you know, I'm working on getting uh, approval for this. I'm working on trying to find an agreement. We're going to make a deal. Uh, just you got to give us time. So if they're threatening to two leak data, sometimes they'll post like a private site. That they'll say, we're going to make that public, you know, ask them to take it down and say, listen, we're, we're, we're working on this. I'm going to get this approved, um, but I got to get, you know, approval from the boss and they need X evidence or whatever. Bring that back to the group that's, you know, in the war room on this. And that war room, is, you know, if you're at the point of negotiation, that war room has to include outside counsel, um, executive leadership. Usually the CEO or president is going to be in those conversations. Uh, inside counsel, certainly as well. If there's a compliance officer, then as well. Uh, CFO, of course, um, and then insurance and outside counsel as well. And insurance, um, you know, very often people think that insurance is just going to foot the bill for whatever, um, but that's really not the case. Uh, the insurance industry just got crushed last year uh, because of all of this. And they're actually changing a lot of their risk models because they lost so much money due to ransomware last year. Um, so insurance is going to try to, you know, push the demand down, right? They're, they want to pay as least as they possibly can. And, you know, every, anybody does in that situation. You don't want to be funding, uh, you know, further digital terrorism. So you want a uh, minimum exposure. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you get together and this is usually going to be the, over the course of several days, sometimes up to a week. I've seen it go two weeks. Um, and the bad guy will have sort of escalating pressure applied throughout that. And to do that, I've seen a, a few strategies. They'll, they'll just get nastier in that chat application I was talking about. Um, or uh, they'll attempt different strategies. And so I, it's funny, I talked about e-commerce chat applications. So one customer, uh, this is an e-commerce customer, uh, e-commerce company, um, they have an e-commerce chat, right? And so the bad guys know who they, uh, they, they've ransomed. And so uh, after you know negotiating with them for some time and not getting the answer that they wanted, they got on the e-commerce chat of the company that we were uh, helping. And they started making threats to the customer service representative that's just working the e-commerce chat. And so we were getting these screenshots from the e-commerce team saying, what is going on? You know, what is this guy talking about? Um, and that was that was a fun one. Uh, we got him through it. Um, but one or another, that was, that was pretty crazy. Another one um, was, uh, I forget what kind of company that was. I think it was a call center company. Um, this was, at, again, after several days of trying to get through negotiation and, and them not getting the number that they wanted, uh, they started making phone calls. And so they were calling people that were either you know senior leadership or they were involved in IT or likely to be involved in the situation. Situation. And through you know, like one of those voice obfuscation uh, applications, they made threats and said, you know, we're going to steal your data. I've got your home address, stuff like that, and making actual threats against uh, uh, you know, safety and lice. Um, I've never seen that actually happen, but I'll tell you what, it scared the heck out of them. I'll tell you that. The CEO is like, I, this guy called me. Can you believe that? And I said, well, I, it's a new one, but uh, it doesn't surprise me one bit. They're, they're ruthless and uh, they'll, they'll do anything. Uh, but yeah, once you get to the point where insurance is on board with a, a number um, and you get to the, the point where you're ready, it's going to get very tense in those last you know few hours or days or whatever it is to get to the point where um, you, you've made an agreement. Uh, then they'll, they'll give you the cryptocurrency address. Um, the cryptocurrency address might be Bitcoin, um, it might be Monero, which is you know more of a private anonymous blockchain than uh, Bitcoin is. Uh, I've seen a few prefer Monero to the point where they'll actually ask for less. Uh, in ransom if it's paid by Monero. 
uh, simply because it's harder for law enforcement to trace. And that's a good point um, because you know one of the things we do in situations like that, if we actually get the cryptocurrency wallet address uh, from the bad guy, we do share that with the FBI uh, and Secret Service because that's really vital information for them uh, to be able to follow the money. So I talked about this ecosystem and the proceeds of the ransom get shared amongst all those actors within the ecosystem. And so if you're looking carefully, uh, you can watch those transactions happen on the blockchain. Right? So if you know the cryptocurrency wallet address of that first person that you're paying, uh, if they get sloppy and don't put it through a Tumblr or some other you know, washing tool within the cryptocurrency ecosystem, then you can see the money move from wallet to wallet to wallet. And you can start to identify who these affiliates are within these ecosystems. And that's exactly what happened with NetWalker, that uh, group that I talked about uh, that got taken down earlier in the year. Um, information uh, was shared you know, with uh, the FBI and uh, Europol that uh, gave them the cryptocurrency addresses and they were able to trace the money. And one of the um, affiliates got a little sloppy and again, didn't uh, wash his money. Um, and they traced him back to Canada um, and were able to put him in jail. So that's a win for the good guys. Um, that doesn't often happen. More often than not, there is no consequence whatsoever. Um, and that's largely because these guys operate um, in jurisdictions that either don't consider what they're doing a crime um, or are actively, you know, profiting from it as well. And I say that, you know, somewhat tongue in cheek because nobody's actually proven this yet, but the vast majority of these operators are Russian. Um, and the affiliates I, I described earlier that are leasing the, the malware from the main groups, they have to prove a couple of things in order to even be an affiliate. Uh, more often than not, like 90th plus percentile, they first have to prove that they can speak Russian um, because a lot of times these, these operations happen on dark web forums that are only in Russian. So unless you learn Cyrillic just for the purpose of being able to go and ransom somebody, you're not going to be able to get into that group. Um, the second thing you usually have to prove is that you've got uh, access to some interesting victim already. Um, because again, they don't want you to just have the ransomware and have it forever. They, they want to establish a time window that you're leasing it. Um, and so you've got to have uh, proof that you're going to be able to deploy it for profit quickly, because that's what this whole game is about, is just speed the money, make money as, pa as fast as you can, um, and avoid, you know, being thrown in jail. Uh, but because they're, you know, in Russia and, uh, you know, or, you know, Eastern Europe, you know, maybe a former Soviet bloc country, um, there, there's no justice brought to them. Um, we might, if we can get to the point of individual attribution, which is really the domain of law enforcement and, and intelligence and not the private sector, it's very difficult for private sector people to uh, uh, actually identify an individual. Um, but if they can do that, um, then they may indict them. We've seen a lot of uh, DOJ indictments of Russians. And so if they travel to you know, a non-Russian country that we have an extradition treaty with, they might get picked up if we can if we can follow them. And that's happened too, where somebody flies from Russia to Spain or something like that, um, and they're arrested in Spain, extradited back to the U.S. and put in jail. Um, but because that NetWalker affiliate uh, was Canadian, um, of course, we've got a very good relationship with Canadian law enforcement, and uh, we were able to lock them up. So good, good job, FBI. If the government doesn't create a deterrence, does it make us look weak? Does it incentivize these actors to just keep going bigger because there's no retaliation, no consequences? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I think it's more than just the, you know, the reputation of the USA uh, in the international you know, landscape of not doing anything. Um, it really is a national security crisis. Um, because, you know, Western interests are being attacked and that's really what, you know, the, the military and our intelligence community are, are there to, to protect. Um, so if you have, you know, this huge, huge pandemic of ransomware that's impacting organizations of all sizes to the point where the entire eastern seaboard's gasoline uh, might dry up because of a ransomware attack or meat supply, you know, may be much more difficult and therefore prices rise. Uh, that's a big, big problem for national economy. And um, I think the government is um, now starting to realize how serious it is and that they've got you know, a stake in the game. Um, but I don't think they're doing enough, uh, frankly. Um, there's a recent executive order put out by the Biden administration that talked about you know, supply chain risks and things like that. Um, but it doesn't really have anything in it for the private sector. It doesn't have any like mandate that thou shalt achieve X level of security. Um, but even that I don't think would be enough because then what you're doing is you're, you're passing the cost of protecting U.S. national security um, onto the businesses that uh, are on the wrong side of, of, of these attacks. Um, so in my opinion, there's got to be some level of funding. And I know, you know, big government's not a, a, a fun topic to talk about. But, um, you know, since there's such a serious national security risk here, I think the government should do something in that regard to at least protect uh, its citizens and businesses. Uh, but from a retaliatory standpoint, 
Um, you know, again, uh, while it might not be visible, um, you know, on the news or anything like that, um, there are, as you know, nation state actors that are out there that uh, attack the U.S. all the time. Um, the most uh, advanced nation state actor is the NSA, um, without a doubt. They are uh, the most capable nation state actor in, in the world, um, and they do uh, definitely take offensive actions against our adversaries. You don't hear about it um, because it's, you know, uh, clandestine operations, and uh, we shouldn't hear about it. Um, but that definitely does happen. We, we've seen a couple of instances of that, not necessarily in response to ransomware, um, but in response to other, you know, major international security issues like what happened in Iran uh, with Stuxnet. And uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with that, that's a really, really interesting story uh, about the uh, collaboration of the Department of Energy, um, the again, the NSA, the CIA, and then ultimately uh, the Israeli Defense Force Unit 8200. Uh, I'd recommend you read about that if you haven't. Yeah, and it's a good segue to the next question. So obviously you guys are an MSSP. Would you mind telling us what you do and why companies should invest in an MSSP? And does it matter the size of the company? I mean, there's a lot of things that we do for customers. Um, you know, everything from building security programs from the ground up or consulting on compliance and stuff like that. Um, attack surface management, so, you know, doing uh, the job of vulnerability management and drawing down the attack surface, which is super important. Um, but within the Cyber Fusion Center here, you know, what we do is we want to monitor customer environments. So we deploy technology into them. Those that I mentioned earlier, so EDR, SIM, very often used, um, best used in concert with one another. Um, typically also some element of attack surface management that we do out of this group as well, where they're scanning for vulnerabilities and uh, fixing them. Um, and, you know, doing that 24 hours a day. So, you know, that's the key thing. Um, very often, uh, it's, it's almost always the case. It'll be Friday afternoon, really late, um, or holiday weekend, like what happened with Kaseya, um, that all this stuff happens. So you have to have constant vigilance. And the reason they do that, the bad guys do that, is because they know it's generally going to be, you know, shorter staff at their victim company. Um, so you need to have somebody that can backstop that and really undergird your your protection. And that's where a 24-7 operation comes in with a lot of skilled analysts that have all the tools, right? So uh, these tools are, are typically pretty costly, but an MSSP can generally make it a lot more approachable and digestible even for smaller companies. Um, you know, things like very you know, enriched intelligence feeds are almost impossible for an average company to get their hands on because either they're very expensive or they just simply don't know how to make use of the information, um, which is actually pretty challenging. But uh, that's what we're here to do. So, yeah, uh, constant vigilance um, and not just, you know, alert factory kind of stuff. So when we see something weird happening, we ship an alert, uh, but actually helping the customer do something about it and escalating it to incident response. Because, you know, not every alert that's going to come out of an EDR or a SIM is you know going to be an incident. Right? It might be, you know, somewhere, like I mentioned, along that kill chain. Like, let's say we detect that initial access. That's not quite yet, you know, a data breach or a ransom situation. But there's still something that you got to do about it. And so, you know, a lot of that boils down to operations. Um, uh, and automation or orchestration and automation of, um, you know, responding to identified threats. So we develop playbooks for customers um, that basically allow for orchestrated actions to happen after you know, a specific incident occurs. And that's tricky to do because every environment's different. So you have to build, you know, custom stuff for each customer. Uh, but that's where it really gets uh, valuable to the customer to be able to do that. So, you know, within that as well, we do curated threat intelligence reports or briefings. I gave one to a company earlier today that was very eye-opening to them. Um, they thought they had it pretty much on lockdown, but I was able to find 47,000 compromised credentials on the dark web um, and other stuff as well, including exposed RDP, like I mentioned, um, and uh, also showed them that uh, a uh, ransom affiliate called Dogecoin, that's his moniker uh, in the dark web form, Exploit, um, who's our, uh, our evil uh, affiliate. So he was selling access to their environment. And uh, since he's a known affiliate of a ransom group, we've, we figured that's a precursor to ransomware and these guys should probably know about that. So we told him it. Um, but yeah, that's what we do 24 hours a day. And uh, the question that you had around company size. Um, so, you know, I think we can be valuable to anybody uh, depending upon what exactly they need or where they're at at their level of maturity um, because size doesn't always equate to security maturity. Uh, often it does because budgets get bigger, the bigger you get. Um, but even a small company can do, you know, a pretty good job of, of protecting them themselves, but we can really backstop that and really accelerate the ability to protect yourself. Um, so, you know, it's about maturity. Um, and there are different sort of tiers of solutions that we can offer to different sizes of companies that make it more affordable or, or whatever. Um, but really, it, we don't look at it necessarily as a company size, but where they're at, uh, you know, in, sort of in the continuum of, of maturity. And, and you talked a bit about intelligence, threat intelligence. Can you talk to your data-driven intelligence approach? 
Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm a huge proponent of threat intelligence. Um, there's a variety of different kinds of threat intelligence. Um, and I'm not talking about like, the brands that you can buy it from, um, you know, like the named ones that you might have heard of. Um, and I'm talking about open source intelligence gathering. So what you can gather just, you know, from public sources or publicly available sources. Uh, those might be available just on a clear net. So what does this particular company's attack surface look like? What vulnerabilities do they have exposed to the Internet? Um, who can I find that has a public persona within that organization? Um, you know, like what's the CEO's name? Maybe I can find him on Facebook and see where he lives. That stuff can be valuable for a threat actor. Um, and that's open source intelligence gathering. Um, that can be really useful for anybody because it gives them a perspective of what the bad guy can find out about them very, very easily. And so I recommend everybody does some OSINT against their own attack surface um, so that they can, again, get the perspective of what bad guys can see. It's sort of a step before like penetration testing because uh, very often in penetration testing, OSINT is going to be one of the first things that you do so that you can identify what you're going to attack. And that's exactly what bad guys do as well. They're going to do OSINT gathering um, and then they're going to identify what they want to attack and then go after it. Uh, but there's other types of intelligence. Signals intelligence is a, 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 the next kind, which basically means the interception of signals or transmissions or communications. Um, and you can do that uh, with a couple of, of strategies. Um, you know, what, what we've done through a partner is basically we're able to intercept botnet traffic. So we can see like into QBot and TrickBot and stuff like that and see um, what they're, you know, who they're talking about. Uh, maybe we can find domain names that uh, you know they're 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 you know talking about within their their communications or their check-ins from the bots back to the botnet, um, and those are really good identifiers of potential serious issues because you know a trick bot, <clears throat> it's there to deliver a payload for a secondary infection. It's not necessarily there you know to do a thing itself. It can. There are certain uh, modular payloads that you can attach to trick bot, but very often it's used to deploy ransomware to get the ransomware package or the attack tools into an environment because uh, the tools have to get into the environment somehow. And so those tools are really there to give a, a communications channel or a download channel to get tools in. Um, so very often we consider those to be precursors of a ransom attack. Um, another thing that you can do from an intelligence gathering standpoint is human intelligence or human. Um, I, th I think I described some of this earlier where on dark web forums like RAID or XSS or exploit, uh, where these, these bad actors are communicating, um, you can read what they're writing. You, have, you, of course, have to have a profile in one of those platforms, and not everybody is granted one just for showing up and asking for one. You have to have, you know, some some ability to prove that uh, you are, you know, within that uh, that ecosystem as well. Uh, but then, again, you're probably going to have to learn Cyrillic to do that, because uh, very often uh, it's in Russian. Um, and even, you know, good translation tools don't always work. Um, so, but you can it, it directly interact with them uh, if you'd like. So if somebody's got you know, for sale, you know, 10,000 RDP servers, and you want to find out who's in that, you know, you can engage with them and uh, try to get the information out. We, we, uh, we well, leverage a partner to do that. Um, and that's exactly like specifically what they do. Uh, but that, that information is extremely valuable because if, if you've got a bad guy who's known to be part of maybe the Ryak syndicate, um, and that bad guy uh, is known to sell, you know, RDP access to Ryak, and if you find out in that stream that they're talking about your company, then you got some problems to solve quickly. Quickly, but you know, if you solve them quickly, then you get in front of it, and that's you know what it's all about. So intelligence is super important, and uh, you know, if you don't have you know good threat intelligence as part of your strategy, then I, th I think that's another thing you should be thinking about. Can you give some kind of success stories around how you're mapping your intelligence approach to preventing attacks, other than what you just mentioned? Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of ways that you can do that. Um, but let's say you've got an alert that comes out of a sim, right, and that alert. Uh, tells you that there's a large data transfer out to some IP address on the internet. And this is probably the most basic form of intelligence, but you can track reputations of IP addresses that are known to have done bad things. Um, and so if you see, you know, uh, again, communications that are to or from an IP address with a bad reputation, that should never happen, right? So there's an obvious indicator that you've got something to do. So if you think about one of the challenges of threat detection is that there's ten there tends to be just a huge volume of data, huge volume of data that you got to sift through uh, to find, you know, not even the needle in a haystack, but the needle in the needle stack. Um, and intelligence can really help you uh, narrow that window down a little bit. So using stuff like even just IP reputation databases is, is easy to do, um, doesn't require a lot of sophistication, can be piped directly into a SIM uh, and is a, is a great way to, to help. Um, but you can get you know, much more complex than that and drive API queries into you know, let's say a good signals intelligence platform to see if perhaps you know there's chatter about you, um, or maybe if you're about to release a new product, for instance, see if there's information on the dark web for sale about 
that new product. You know, there's a lot of ways that you can do it um, that would provide benefit. But, you know, it's not easy to do. Um, the simple stuff that I described around IP reputation is, uh, but more sophisticated stuff is pretty challenging to, to make work unless you have, you know, a lot of maturity within your own cyber operations center. And would you mind uh, explaining a bit about the third party risk as it relates to managed security providers? Yeah, sure. Uh, we, we talked about this a little last time, but I mean, that's what Kaseya is all about, right? And then Kaseya is not the only example of that. You had solar winds that happened a while back. Uh, those sort of supply chain risks, they really just, they're third party risks. That's what they're about. So all that means is your first party risk is what's happening directly in your environment that's under your control. Uh, but third party risk means some vendor or service provider is providing you something. Um, and that thing has some inherent risk built into it that you then inherit uh, because of your, your consuming a product, or consuming a service from that vendor. Um, so if then if the vendor is not doing their job, um, you might have a really bad day. And that's that's what happened with Kaseya and uh, the attack there um, because Kaseya had some issues. Um, bad guys were able to leverage the Kaseya VSA platform, which is the on-prem version of their, their platform. So all these vulnerable VSAs that are installed across you know, 1, 1,500 customers um, through their MSP, because it's a widely used MSP tool, um, that you know, they're able to ransom a huge number of organizations. I think the number I heard was $70 million in total proceeds from ransom on that, but I'm sure that hasn't completely played out yet. Um, so then the MSP is a link in that chain of risk, right? So the MSP who consumes a product uh, deploys it to their customers and ultimately in their customer's best interest becomes a leverage point where the bad guy, because they know MSPs and MSSPs have connections to many customers and usually persistent connections that are always on um, and they usually will have privileged access to the customer network so they can do patching and things like that. Um, if the bad guy can break the MSP or the MSSP open, then they've got you know keys to the kingdom of very many other you know adjacent victims. And so that's a very interesting target for a threat actor, because uh, again, like I said earlier, it's all about speed of monetization. And if they can uh, break into 500 companies with one attack versus you know 500 individual attacks, that's obviously going to give them a lot more profitability on that operation. And they do you know they're looking for profits. So that's really you know the key thing about the attacks against MSSPs and MSPs. I've seen it. More more uh, be the MSP that gets attacked and not the managed security provider, uh, sort of, uh, um, MSSP. Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. First off, I think, you know, I hope uh, MSSPs are doing a better job of security themselves and maybe, uh, you know, less um, uh, vulnerable to that kind of attack. Um, but then secondly, at least, you know, here and in my experience, um, the way that we connect to our customer networks is through a zero trust model. So we, we really can't present a uh, risk like that to a customer um, unless maybe the technology uh, that we get through our alliances happens to have some better vulnerabilities in it. Um, but and, and then also we more often than not, I'd say probably 95 percent, if not more, we don't have privileged accounts uh, in the customer environment. Uh, we might have accounts to manage our application. Um, but that doesn't convey us like domain administrator uh, capabilities. So even if somebody were to leverage us and you know crack our credentials, which I hope is impossible, I'm going to knock on wood later, um, they wouldn't be able to use those credentials to to pop a customer. So, um, but you know, very many MSPs. Um, uh, surprisingly, uh, we provide services to a lot of MSSPs that are MSPs that want to add security to their, their capabilities. Um, you know, first thing we're going to do is inspect whether or not they've got their own environment secured. And often they don't. Uh, often these are, you know, small shops that uh, maybe have, you know, five or six people, something like that, um, and are not really, you know, equipped to do security the right way or maybe just didn't know. And so um, that's, I think, the case in a lot of places where uh, bad guys see um, interesting targets that might also be soft targets. And because of the, you know, the, the sort of cascading effect of all their customers, they're just ripe targets to go after and you know, with a lot of success. So cybersecurity is important to companies that are collecting data, customer information, personal data. They're held responsible to keep that information safe. So when it comes to your personal online security, what are the things that we can as individuals do to best keep our data and personal information safe? Yeah, it's a good question. So I get that a lot. Um, the I think there's, uh, you know, again, several things that you can do. Um, I'm going to start with some really easy stuff that uh, doesn't require any level of technical skill set. Um, you know, and that's locking your credit. Um, you know, identity theft is real; it happens. But if your credit is locked, even if I've been able to, or a bad guy's able to steal your social security number, 
Uh, they're not going to be able to create new accounts uh, under your name and, and things like that, which we often see. They may still be able to charge against the credit card, you know, that um, they, they've stole the number from, um, but they're not going to be able to open new accounts, which can, which can be much, much more damaging than just running up a credit card bill. Uh, so that's one thing. And to do that, all you got to do is go to one of the credit bureaus, get a, a free account, uh, and then lock your credit. And that's a really simple thing anybody can do. Um, I think the other thing that everybody has are passwords. Um, and people, unfortunately, just have terrible, terrible passwords time and again. Um, <laughs> I was working with, earlier today. Um, we did, a, a, again, a, a little bit of a threat intel scrape on this company and noticed that um, that RDP server that was for sale that I described, um, uh, the username uh, that was available for sale was help desk. And the password was capital P uh, at, uh, password zero one. Um, so that's just a terrible password. And I can't believe in 2021, people are still using passwords like that, but it's probably the most widely used password in the world. Um, and when you've got, you know, a password policy that requires like eight characters, alphanumeric, you know, that's a compliant password. Like that passes the check of, is this password safe to use? And it's, it's nuts to me. So, you know, have complex passwords and I have people say, well, how can I possibly remember these hundred passwords? Cause the other recommendation I, I will make is don't reuse passwords. Like don't have the same password for your corporate account, like your business logging in at the company as you do on Facebook or your bank um, or anything like that. Because let's say, I don't know, LinkedIn uh, has a data breach and your password to LinkedIn uh, winds up in the hands of the bad guy. If you happen to use that for your company, you know, what happens? I, I can just scrape off of LinkedIn. Where does this guy work? And now I know where he works. And if I can guess your username, which is generally going to be really easy, right? Just first name dot last name or first initial last name. And you happen to have made the mistake of reusing passwords then bam, I've got into that customer or that victim. Uh, so don't reuse passwords. But then the problem becomes, how do I remember these passwords? Password vaults. Uh, you don't even have to remember the passwords. Uh, and the password vaults will often, the good ones, uh, will just randomly generate a strong password. Um, so at that point, you know, they're all stored in a vault. Um, then, of course, there's some concentration of risk in the vault itself. So let's say, you know, the, the company that makes the, the password vault gets compromised and has a supply chain attack there. That's going to be a really bad day for everybody. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Holy crap, knock on wood again. Um, but that's a good strategy, right? And that you're at least taking a couple of steps to protect that really critical credential. Uh, and the other thing, the third thing, um, is use multi-factor authentication everywhere. So pretty much every website that's you know of any reputation or any level of security is going to offer you the option to turn on multi-factor authentication. Uh, you have to do that. You have to do that because then even if I steal your password, um, I can't duplicate that one-time you know code that the multi-factor authentication creates. Um, and not just in your personal life, but every business out there. So if you're listening to this in your company and you don't have multi-factor authentication, you know do it tomorrow. Uh, don't don't wait because um, it's it's a critical control to have. You know certainly at bare minimum on anything that's publicly available to the internet has to have multi-factor authentication on it. I would prefer to have every uh, internal application within the environment also have multi-factor. So when I log into my laptop, I got to plug in the one-time password from my phone. So at that point, the bad guy has to know my password and steal my phone, and that's pretty unlikely. So that's a key thing. Before we uh, close out today's episode, is there anything else you'd like to touch on that we didn't cover? Well, you know, like I said earlier, uh, it's an existential risk. Um, you know, we see it in the headlines every day now. Um, the thing that I, I worry about there is there there becomes something called you know breach fatigue, where because it's happened so much and you see it so often in the news, you start to get jaded to it uh, and you, you stop paying attention to it. Um, even in you know a cyber fusion center like this, there's such a huge volume of alerts and alarms that you get what's called alert fatigue. It's a really similar concept because there's so many of them, it just wears you out. Um, so you can't let that happen. You have to have constant vigilance. Um, you, you can take steps to protect yourself. You can take steps to protect your company. Uh, but don't think that just because you see it happening all the time in the news that um, you know it must not be that big a situation or that that bad. It really is. You're seeing it in the news because it's it's crippling when it happens to these these organizations. Um, so take it seriously. You know, do whatever you can to uh, again prepare, prevent, detect, respond, and recover from uh, a serious incident. Thank you so much, Paul. It's been fascinating. Uh, we could spend hours with you, but you have to go back to putting out fires, unfortunately. And there's not one for me to put out, but probably is. <laughs> so if anyone would like to get in touch with you, ask questions uh, about you, your services, what's the best way for them to reach you? 
Yeah, sure. Um, you can reach me on LinkedIn. Um, so, you know, maybe you can put that uh, in the chat or something like that or overlay with my LinkedIn address and happy to take connections. If you just want to talk about cybersecurity, it's cool by me. Um, this is obviously my passion. So I like talking to other passionate people about it. Um, if you want to know more about Avertium, it's www.avertium.com. Uh, we'd be happy to help. So there you go. And another added value that we like to provide for our guests is recruiting. Are you actively recruiting? We are. Yeah, uh, very, very actively. Um, so we hire pretty much anywhere in the country. So we've got operation centers uh, here. I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee today. I'm actually based in Washington, D.C., but one of our cyber fusion centers is here. So I was here for uh, the week. Um, next week, I'll be in Phoenix at uh, one of our other cyber fusion centers. So we're hiring in both locations. We also have a third uh, CFC in Longmont, Colorado. Uh, so if you have an interest in being a cybersecurity analyst inside you know, high velocity, interesting cyber fusion center. We're looking for people like that. Um, we also have remote um, positions for a pretty broad array uh, of capabilities from penetration testing to GRC compliance uh, consultants uh, to digital forensics incident response, um, even on the sales side. So, you know, if, you, if you're interested in, in uh, even just breaking into security through that route, you're, we're, we're growing fast. So happy to have you. Awesome. We'll definitely include all that information uh, in the show notes. So thank you so much again for joining us today on Cybersecurity Heroes. And uh, to the rest of you, we'll see you next time. Awesome. Thanks, Brendan. Appreciate it. That's a wrap for this episode of Cybersecurity Heroes. Practical and experiential knowledge on a day in the life of security heroes catch our next episode by subscribing through your favorite podcast platform. If you're listening in Apple podcasts, please leave a rating for the show. They really help a lot. Thank you so much for listening until next time.